Hello, my friends. I'm here with my buddy, Daryl. And today we're going to debate the topic of AI and why are government entities, educational institutions, and some people opposed to AI. Now, when technology came out back in the 1930s and 40s, people have historically opposed technology for reasons such as, is it safe? Maybe it's spying on us. Like when TV came out, some religious institution said it was the devil. Now that AI is out, it's no different. And I'm just curious to know what you at home, right? Daryl is curious to know as well. Why are you for or against AI? It's a discussion that needs to be had. And I don't know if you folks have watched Sam Altman's talk about why AI needs to be looked at cautiously. He had a discussion with the folks at Congress and there were some other folks in attendance from IBM and private companies. But I'm curious to know, Daryl, does government have a disposition to AI based on what you've heard? As far as government or other entities feel, I can speak on behalf of them, but as far as information be put out there through YouTube, social media. There has been some pushback or, or some clones about AI, mostly for chat GPT. Wow. And why do you think that perception, is it a lack of understanding? Because I can appreciate that AI is complex, right? It's honestly just looking at AI, the complexity of it, is enough to send your head spinning because I'm like, I can't believe this is just a large language model using the idea of what comes next to tell me what I'm asking it. So there's some misunderstandings about AI, but it is very rapidly evolving. And I can understand that a lot of policymakers may not understand the potential implications or the benefits. And there's this lack of understanding that could lead to some hesitation in, in how they're going to regulate it. It's like the beast that you don't know how to control. You, the beast shouldn't be put out. You, sh you shouldn't take the beast down totally, but how do you control it? Do you think it's some of that? It's, it's all of that, but I'm a huge component of sort of data, privacy, and security. And as a perspective coming from the government industry, ChatGPT, it's a large language model, but at the same time, it collects personal and sensitive information. And that's why I feel that the, that the US government or other entities are opposed to including ChatGPT in their project environment. That's a good point. And I know that the likes of Google, who are a huge competitor of OpenAI, they've come forward to say, we don't, we're not collecting anyone's personal information. That's what makes some people want to warm up a little bit more to BARD. So you do have a point there. But in addition to the security concerns, the regulations that are around things like monopolies, unfair advantage, and so on, is also going to come into play. The question of who owns the content that AI creates when AI scours whatever repositories it is to create that content. That has also been a concern. You know, what else? There are also concerns about how data is collected, stored, used, and also secured too. Breaches can actually happen in, in, in some environments. Privacy misuse of information. Honestly, you can ask Chat PT on how to hack into a specific program. Honestly, it probably won't do that because of the triggers that be at the ethical side. But you could probably ask Chat GPT those types of questions, and it'll probably spin out some answers to that. Yeah. So that's that's the other concerns from a government perspective of having Chat GPT or some sort of AI model within their, their program or project. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Daryl, to play the advocate on the side of AI, there's also a concern that the government has for regulating too soon, regulating too quick, being too heavy handed, because AI, 
the way it's proceeding, we can tell that great things are ahead. It's going to be able to work on in the medical front, on people and analyze huge repositories of, of medical data that people would never have thought they could analyze that quick or that effectively. And when we're looking for cures to common diseases that generally have been hard for people to deal with, cures for things like cancer, people are becoming a little bit more hopeful that AI is going to help the human race a whole lot. So the government should be concerned from the other angle, because I, I know they may be opposed to it because of the dangers it can have, but what about the good that it can bring? And what about if they are the, the people standing in the way of the great things that AI could do? That's also a concern. So yes, we are going at a very rapid rate regarding AI and chat GPT. The, the funny thing is when people look at chat GPT, they think, oh, that is the flagship AI. No, AI has been around for a long time. When you think about AI phone services, you call and it knows who you are and is able to have dialogue and converse with you. That's AI. So AI did just come on the scene. It's been around, but the other concerns that you mentioned, yes, I can understand that. Open AI needs to be more transparent and any other AI company about the data that they collect and store. But there's also, like I said, that concern about balancing innovation. How do you balance innovation and regulation? Because governments, they generally strive to foster innovation. We hear, oh, we're sponsoring this venture and small businesses and people who want to be more innovative. And I was a, once upon a time, the likes of Elon were helped by this whole innovative initiative that government had. So now there's, there needs to be a balance between regulation and innovation. So the place to draw the line, that's where I can see a concern. And it seems like the government, when I, and I'm not just talking about the US government, I'm talking about any government, I can see why governments may need to, as it were, stall for time or speak to the likes of Sam and others trying to find a way forward. Someone I would like to hear a little bit more about, and I don't know if you've heard anything from the officially from Microsoft, but I haven't really listened to Bill's thoughts. I know they've sunk a bunch of money into it. Do you know how much money Microsoft have put into the whole open AI thing? And any I'm idea? sure it's, just, it's, it's probably into billions. There's a rumor that it was in, in the tens of billions, but I, who knows? I don't know. But I know they've got a lot of money. And I know that they've been in the game will be a huge advantage. But again, going back to the question of balancing innovation and regulation, I can see why the government feels they need to stall for time. And I can see why some people in government are just going to be indifferent. Because how much control is too much, right? If we talk about regulations, it could be premature because there's probably not as much understanding. And if we talk about excessive regulations, then it could stifle the great things that AI could do for us. So I can understand that. But Daryl, you, you're maintaining a very in the middle of the road perspective, which is healthy. It's good to always play the fall and then play the devil's advocate against so that you can max out the forces for and the forces against. And that's honestly what I see government doing the same disposition you have, a force for and a force against, and that's the only way you're going to get a balanced perspective. And honestly, if you're someone in government and you're watching this discussion to gain insights, there's something in the world of project management we call the force field analysis. I think everyone in government, mentally and maybe collectively, they need to have a forces for, they need to do a force field analysis, right, Daryl? What do you think? I absolutely agree, Cheryl. And to also express the neutrality of this video, um, it's okay to be on the pro side or the con side. There's no harm or no foul in being against it or for it, but just know it's coming and it's going to be part of our lives and in the near future. One so, of the things, go on, Daryl. I was going to ask a question. So, what do you think or how do you feel about? AI um, being biased. <laughs> Honestly, I've had experiences myself. 
So I'll, I'll just be open and honest and transparent here. I'm very in the middle of the road. I'm a rather nonpartisan individual for most intents and purposes. <laughs> Although I have leanings I'm not going to go into because we don't want to make this political. But case in point, I asked Dolly to create an image for me of three former presidents having lunch. I said, I want, I want to see Donald, Joe, and Barack having lunch. And it, it immediately said, you don't do that here. I'm like, oh. Then I asked it to do an image for me of Joe, and it spat it out. And then I asked Midjourney as well for an image of presidents. And nah, I said, you don't do that. You're going to get in trouble. <laughs> So watch out. And then I asked it to do an image for me of Barack alone, and it did. So that was one instance. There have been other instances of us, GPT, to do things, and it says, I'm not going to do that, or I'm not going to say that. Like I asked it to debate something about men and women, or men versus women. And it was going to put the men in a good light. And it seemed to not want to engage. And then I asked it to do the same for women and put the women in the good light. It complied wholeheartedly. <laughs> and it did. So I don't know where these biases are coming from, whether these are from the programmers of the tool that have embedded some sort of intelligence. But I've realized, based on what I've heard in media, a lot of people try something with GPT and it refuses. And then they try again and it allows. So I don't know if it's just the variability it's like playing the lottery you don't know whether you're going to win a windfall or not it could be that but at the same time it, it could be so i actually posted once i said is gpt woke <laughs> because the response that i was getting from it was tending towards that ideology and um again this is not political or critical of any party or anyone but i notice i do notice some biases when it comes to GPT. For Bard.ai, I haven't experienced that yet. Maybe I need to relate with it a little bit more and form a different opinion, but I, I've not noticed that from Bard. But from GPT, I would say it is somewhat biased and it is somewhat preachy. I, have you experienced that there with GPT comes at you like a it's a preacher slamming your head with a, don't do that, but you're being a bad person. Not that it said that literally, but you ask mm -hmm. it a question and it's not preaching to you. Do this, don't do this as an AI tool and this, but as a human, I would advise not to do this and that. And it's not, that's not a bad thing, but it could be looked at as bias. What has your experience been? So, as far as keeping at the neutral level being biased, I trained ChatGPT, my ChatGPT, in a scenario-based environment. So, to explain it all, I'm asking ChatGPT to become an expert in a specific topic or a specific industry, like say project management or urban value management. I would type out nor all instructions before my previous uh, chats. And then I type on a scenario base as far as chat GPT being the expert of having project management with 20 years of experience and chat GPT is here to serve me in the questions that I need to be at GP answered. I found that approach a lot more helpful in, mm. in, in some way and being a, a normal user with ChatGPT. But being biased, I have experienced that. But at the same time, I, I, I stick to the scenario-based type of mm. question. Okay. That's smart. I, another concern that governments have is who's going to find the oil well first. So now that AI is on the scene, government's asking the question, 
who's going to get the best AI? Who's going to make the most of AI? Because like it or not, we're all competitive animals for most intents and purposes across countries. So there's the question of who's going who's gonna to find the oil well of AI and maximize it more than anyone else? So this whole idea about international competitiveness, I feel that governments might be concerned that if they are too stringent in their regulations, then it could put their country at a competitive disadvantage. The question such as China versus the United States, who has the tighter regulations, that could put one country at a competitive advantage compared to nations that have a more relaxed view or no view, a <laughs> low or no view. In fact, I can see people taking up going to countries that have no view on this and like just making an empire there because there's no stringent regulations that could put their innovation at risk or curtail it. So it's striking a balance. It goes back to that striking a balance between regulation and a favorable environment for AI. So I understand if governments feel that way, yes. Also, let's talk about the creatives, those in the art space. And I come from an art family. My mom's an artist. I'm a musician as well. And there is a huge concern about AI and art. AI and art, such as I asked for a Van Gogh impression, does Van Gogh's family own some of that? Since he is an innovator, it's like asking the machine to create for me some software that I could impersonate such and such tool, or I could design the equivalent of a Tesla, write me code. Right now, that will be crazily extensive, but it's going to get to the point that AI becomes so smart, it can pick from things and use it to impersonate or create off other people's work. Another example is the work of Rembrandt. I've asked Dolly to create some Rembrandt impressions, and it's done very well. I asked it to create some work of Cezanne, and it did very well. The Picasso impressions were also believable. So when you're doing things like that, the question is, are you hurting art? Are you hurting the art form? And there's some people who are very passionate, like we've got the environmentalists, we've got the pro real art. And those people, they could very well be radical in their view of AI replacing traditional art. And now let's talk about music as well. So Phil, it's, it sounds like you, you value ethics in project management and also in also project management, but inside that space. Yeah. It's more like a concern for the art form because I love art, but I love innovation and I love being able to create with available technology. I don't want to be stifled by feeling, oh, I'm not allowed to create art with this tool because so maybe the, I don't know whether there needs to be restrictions on creating art in the style of I'm talking about music. There's re very recently been this buzz about the AI Drake, Drake, the yes. artist. Yeah. So there's an AI Drake that some people say it sounds even better than Drake, that he really gave Drake a run for his money. But again, the company, music company industry behind him said, no, this is this needs to be taken down. So it was taken off the social media platforms. But then again, that begs the question, who owned that new track? So it's new lyrics. It's not Drake singing or rapping, but it got to the point that it was so much like him that it begged the question, does Drake own a piece of that? So that blurry ground in between who owns what is created by AI and truly does does, does, do you have rights to that or are you a co-creator? It's like when you take the lyrics of a song and then you change the melody or the beat, the rhythm, 
the original owner of the lyrics still has some rights in that. So is it going to get to that? There's so much murky ground around the rights, intellectual property rights. It's, it could be quite concerning. Yeah, especially with creating templates and documents, you know, either it be music or or, or even in project management, especially be at ethical perspective. Having a bad apple submit RFP with <laughs> AI generated RFP with no uh, put into it, it's uh, it can really raise some red flags. That's a good point. I and again, it begs a question, Daryl. Is that ethically, just ethically and morally bad, or is that something that needs to be outlawed? Maybe maybe we're already tardy to the party because people submit RFPs all the submit responses to RFPs all the time that are insincere. They know very well they can't do half of it. Then they win the award. Then they're running scrambling to look for who can fulfill it. So that I think that's already happening, Daryl. That's already going on. Whether to make that explicitly not ideal, like when you put out an RFP. No AI responses. <laughs> mm -hmm. So make it part of the stipulation. We don't want AI as part of the response. And if AI is detected, then you're already going to be disqualified. I think they're going to be tools that they don't even need to be. You don't even need to scan the RFP. It just comes through the system and it's already flagged AI discarded. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that is a way forward, but I think it could very well get to that. And colleges bringing them into the discussion, they also have this concern. It's, it's the same thing, though. I think you're right. It really boils down to the topic of ethics. What is ethical regarding submitting a response to an RFP, creating a technical proposal? And when is it not a bad thing to harness AI when doing that? What do you think? In my opinion, I feel that it can be used against the good of AI as far as where we want to take AI. And that's why I'm a firm believer of what Sam Baldwin said that we need to regulate more on a government perspective and more at the user's perspective to control AI um, in some fashion. Because even in my journey with doing case studies for earned value management, Using ChatGPT, it's uh, it's mind-boggling, and it makes me concerned about the individual stepping into a new industry and how they can use that as cheating. And maybe it's not considered cheating today, but what about a year from now or two years from now? It just takes away the pump, the uh -huh. thinking process. And if you're able to regulate it at a user perspective or maybe at a higher level, I feel that it can do a lot more good. That's a really good point, Daryl. So let's debate just for the, just for the sake of this discussion. Let's debate one of the things you brought up on our agenda here, which is the topic of colleges, right? So one of one of the concerns that colleges have is the thinking question. Does AI rob you of thinking? And if AI is looked at as robbing people of thinking and developing those skills, then how do they survive? Or to be the advocate here for against, is it possible that the future of the world is not in how well you think, but in how well you can prompt engineer, because thinking is a task like cleaning your backyard or washing your car or doing your laundry that can be done for you. Are we getting to the point where thinking is going to become more mundane, like cleaning out your pool, changing fixtures in your house, 
where someone can do that for you, but instead of you doing the thinking, there are certain things or certain thinking that can be done by someone or something else. So can we look at the thinking piece of life as being fair game for AI? The likes of Einstein back in the day, someone said, Einstein, what is this times this? And he just said, I don't know. Why should I fill my head with things that I can easily open a book and find was his response. And it, it made me think, maybe Einstein is right. Maybe the new normal is, why do I need to have PV equals FV divided by one plus R to the power of N and similar things in my head when I can ask AI, when I can have a device that can do my thinking for me? Why do I need to worry about how I respond to an RFN, IFN, when part of my thinking rights are, I've got a robot that can do it for me. I'm going to think about how to interact with the individuals within the contract, as opposed to thinking about how to craft the whole thing. Maybe it can create a technical proposal for me. So I'm not saying that's my view, but I'm being the advocate here for, is that, is that becoming the new normal? The same way you can get a robot that will clean the leaves in your pool, is it like having a robot that does the thinking and does the dishes? Is AI just another robot that can do whatever you want it to do within legal limits? You know what I mean? So those are my thoughts, Daryl. Maybe the new norm for thinking is, hey, I'll do your thinking for you. And, but it needs to be very clear is this illegal? A lot of schools. And it's have... all great. It's all great thoughts. Really great thoughts. Yeah, I think speaking of technology, I think technology is tricking us here. I think there's a delay between you and me. But is that a fair idea, Daryl, that AI could be your thinking agent? It can be. I know a lot of professionals nowadays have been using it as far as their everyday use. I use it on, on a daily basis, but it's more for guidance to keep me steady with the knowledge that they have to attain, especially for my, my session. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm able to type question in chat GPT and I already know whether or not it's wrong or not. Yeah. And that's the difference between our level of understanding GPT vice um, the novice or the beginner of using chat GPT. Absolutely. There are a lot of thoughts, a lot of concerns, and neither of us has the answers, which is why we're here to debate. For those of you just joining, my buddy Daryl here and I are debating AI, chat GPT, BOD, and the like. And we're trying to come to some sort of clarity about what steps need to follow with government, individuals, institutions. I work with a lot of government, just like you have. I work with a lot of institutions. And I'll say that the idea of AI in a lot of top institutions is becoming, we can't outlaw it completely but we can have some stipulations in place about what kind of data you put in. For example, I work with a lot of tech companies and some of their thinking is, we're not gonna ban our people from using it, but we're going to regulate how they put information into it. So anything that is trade secret or peculiar to us, or is not a general question or has any type of information in it that's confidential, we don't want you to do that. But if it's looking for a formula or looking for clarity on an idea that is not a trademarked idea, uh, feel free to do that. So the whole control from some companies is changing. Some companies are actually looking to learn more. I've actually had a number of invitations over the past month, which is mind blowing about government entities looking to learn more about AI and saying, hey, we 
um, talk to us about AI or create a course to just educate us about AI. So that is happening. But in that regard, Daryl, I think another major concern, and that's me as an individual, is how will this disrupt the workforce? And the concern is not for me or you, because you and I were one of the earlier adopters of the whole thing. And, and thanks to you, I adopted it quite early. But the whole concern that some of our colleagues in project management have about workforce disruption, how will it disrupt the workforce? If it leads to automating your Microsoft project schedule such that you don't even need to get involved very much, or it automates earned value calculations and analysis on a big old program where you and I would have made hundreds of thousands of dollars being a consultant on, but GPT just spits out all of the analyses, all of the cumulative graphs, all of the variance analyses, the TCPI, and more, the earned schedule, everything till the cows came home, and he doesn't need Daryl or Phil anymore. Does that concern you? It does. It, it does at a level where I'm looking at it at a double-edged sword, how I'm seeing it at a vision perspective. Of course, ChatGPT can make, or not make, it can spit out tasks that, that you ask questions to, and even faster than you can even think of. And it's probably more accurate at a 95% statistic if you were to do two or three attempts to asking the same question. They'll probably get it right on the second question, mm. asking the same question. So it is a concern. I see it as a concern by the same time as a double-edged sword, um, especially with project management and that um, it's not going to replace us. It'll definitely replace other industries like fast food mm. and speaking business. I'm pretty sure if the fast food venture in that environment first before any other industry. Mm -hmm. um, just for example, McDonald's is hiring you at $19. Right now, it's just a fashion nowadays, but if you take a, if you take a step back, that's probably walking down towards having the automated McDonald's where you're actually talking to a robot because CEOs or the McDonald's or the, um, the, the food industry is going to realize that we don't need this amount of people to pay mm. this amount of people for these people. How we can use it, a bot or chat wow. GPT or some sort of robot. Wow. So I feel that raising the prices, prices, raising the wages, Wait. especially on the food industry, there's a it's going to be more of an AI environment going into that. Sooner wow. later, it's going to have a going to have a bot, a robot, giving us our problems mm -hmm. in some way. And honestly, Daryl, you bring up a very good point because some people they say, "Oh, the humans in the kitchen, I don't trust them. What could they do to my food?" But if you had a bot, you wouldn't have that kind of concern. So there might be a higher level of quality right? There might be a higher level of repeatability of good practices that once you programmed it in, it can spot a speck a mile away. So it knows how to prepare the food to that standard. Another concern that people have is just a general rudeness you get from some of the agents when you pull up to a fast food restaurant and their lack of get alongness. A bot isn't going to do that. It's going to be polite. It's going to be a higher level of service. And that takes us to the question of, are we becoming more desensitized to the importance of having humans? Or should that not even be a concern? For example, you ask someone, what is 5,925,000 times 8,000? And would you rather hear the result from a human or a computer? Of course, you're going to choose the computer. And I'm going to choose the human because you're concerned. I think it's going to get to the point where you go to the doctor and you ask, hey, I want to do this procedure. And if the doctor says, I'll do it myself, you'd be like, no, I'd rather choose, I'd rather choose the AI or the bot that has been programmed with AI. 
I think that's where we're going to get to eventually that a lot of the very expensive procedures, AI can do it for you. Even in the world of dentistry, it's going to get so precise that people are going to have more confidence in AI oriented solutions than human. That's me being a for, being in the mind of I'm for AI. You know, so in, in this regard, I can see the importance of humans having jobs. But is it, Daryl, that maybe the doctor and the dentist just need to get better with AI so that they can even offer better customer service and higher level of quality and health? What do you think about that? I'm, I'm going to see for it, but at the same time, I'm going to ask the question back to you to in a project manager's perspective. Do you feel a project manager should have that same benefit? Good question. So let's think about what project managers do. If you look at the history of project management and what the grades have said in management and in leadership over time, what we have learned is that when we communicate as project managers, we're just doing 70 to 90 percent of our work right because the project manager spends 70 to 90 percent of the time communicating the question is what is the project manager communicating so project managers communicating scope schedule budget status deliberating on quality with stakeholders communicating procurement oriented stuff resource oriented stuff so the job of a project manager is less about the calculations, more about the communications. So what if I had a calculator that could help my calculations, make them more reliable, quicker to save time, free time so that I even have more time to do more important communications. If that is what AI can do for someone that already has the knowledge, like you said, it's not that I'm just taking any old junk that the tool spits out. I know if it's right or wrong. If you are at that level and you have AI to help you with the calculations of schedule, budget, variances, risk, I even think the world of the Monte Carlo, it's gonna, it's gonna change the whole my friends at palisade.com now they have an even bigger run for their money because now they have ai like never before so as opposed to it just being a plugin that needs so much human interaction and intervention to put good data in i think it's going to get to a point where ai through using empiricism and historical information is going to be able to pull that data into a tool so that instead of the pessimistic, optimistic, most likely humans put it in, I think it's going to get to the point that AI will even correct you. Uh, Phil, you actually made a mistake. The pessimistic estimate that we deduced in 2005 for well, this task is actually 2.8 million, not 2.5. I think it's going to get to the point where AI actually becomes our friend and helps us check. Like, honestly, I see it like spell check on Word, where you're using Word and we've become so reliant on the orange squiggly line that tells you, I think you meant to say performance, yeah. not something else. I think it's going to get to the point that we as project managers have a better mousetrap, a better tool. But again, it goes back to the saying, a tool or fool with a tool, a tool in the hands of a fool doesn't change. There's still a fool. I think it's going to get to that point that a fool with a tool is still a fool, but a genius with a tool is on a, on a much higher level. Because one of the things we do in project management, we take a look at the tools, right? And we say, do you want an automated tool? Do you want a handheld to remember? It's part of that thing we do in decision making when we're looking at acquiring resources. I think when it comes to acquiring resources, AI is just a resource. So the question is going to be, do you want a dummy terminal without a brain? Or do you want a full-blown functioning tool that can help you as a project manager be more mindful, 
of metrics and measurements without having to cram them all. Because AI can just go back to the archives and say, based on empiricism, which is, by the way, in line with being agile, based on empiricism, you should be looking at 25 story points for this, not 30. It could actually correct you in your favor or correct you in a way that may save the day, right? So when it comes to project management, that's why, and I don't mean to make this a plug, but maybe it's a plug that's needed because a lot of project managers don't know there's AI training for project managers on Udemy. So if you go to Udemy and you put in udemy.com forward slash uh, chat GPTs with mm -hmm. chat GPTs, you can actually sign up for my course on AI for project managers. So I strongly believe that project managers should know about AI and should harness AI in an ethical fashion, but they need to be smart. Because if they're not, guess what? The competition is harnessing AI. They are. Yeah. yeah. And the beginning of my journey with ChatGPT, the question that really stuck out the most for me was, how can I use this tool to better project managers and better myself? PM and get the return on investment, putting those three letters in by um, an name. And then I found that using it to help as a guide, it, it's really powerful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyone who isn't on the bandwagon of AI to learn it, they're already like years behind because it's moved so drastically and dynamically, Daryl, that the way I do business today has been impacted hugely by AI in so many ways. I, I don't want to go into all the ways, but I'll give one example. There was a task that I used to carry out for my business, and this task would take upwards of 24 hours and I'm talking about 24 hours spread over a week. It was a very laborious, arduous task that had to do with, first of all, doing some analysis, then gathering data, then assembling the data, then putting it in a format, and a bunch more things. Daryl, today, <laughs> thanks to you. For those who don't know, Daryl is the person who got me caught on to this whole chat GPT thing. But as a result of using GPT, this task takes me minutes. So before I would have to do all this bunch of work, then I would have to do, I'd have to do many hours to even begin to get output. So someone says, Phil, is it that you didn't break it down to be more agile? No, even if I was being agile, I would have still had to do many hours. But now if I'm being even super agile in how I use the tool, I can knock out content that would have taken me a long time to process, put through all the checks and balances. Now I can say, here's my standard chat GPT. Here's data. I need you to validate this data against this standard. Now, what do you know? The tool does it for me in minutes. If you had tens of thousands of entries and you needed to validate them, you could take those entries and incrementally put them into GPT for validation. And it will look at the standard and say, that's correct, that's correct, that's wrong. That's correct, that's correct, that's wrong. And think like that. Another example is the data that we generate from students taking our quizzes and our mock exams. That data, vanilla flavored, not with names or anything, just scores. I can give it to GPT and ask it to analyze these scores from a statistical perspective, as you like doing that, I could ask the tool, think like a st statistician who has 50 years of experience in government, in commercial, in education, analyze this for me and give me an output. Tell me what the data is telling me. And what do you know? I would have had to pay a statistician with 50 years of experience to get that same output. So I have a question, Phil. So ChatGPT allows us to 
have self-learning. We can self-teach ourselves now. Um, I'm a firm believer in always learning. And one of my use cases with ChatGPT is teaching me to learn a skill set. So I asked it to teach me Microsoft VBAs. It did. <laughs> it gave me steps. It gave me lessons, plans, everything. Everything that you can think of as a coach or paying for a boot camp or some sort of training, it actually trained me to go into Microsoft Project, click on this, click on that, wow. gave me a summary, gave me the entire scope of what I need to understand. My question to you is, as, as, a, as you have been being a trainer and a coach, what are your thoughts about that as far as not would will, will that be more marketable in the coaching business or would that make a negative impact from, from your experience as a coach? Great question, Daryl. And in my mind, I just look at this as consumption, right? It's consumption of content. So whether you're consuming content on TikTok or you're consuming content on a formal lecture database or you're consuming content on YouTube, it's content. The value of the content is debatable. I may find value from watching a cat playing the piano and you may think that's absolutely ridiculous. You may find value from learning, but in my mind, it's still content. It's still just communications. However, it's dispersed to the person finding the benefit from it. So in my mind, it's already happening and I have no feelings about it because here's a perspective and it's, it's a very universal perspective, but you're either consuming content from me or you're consuming content from the rest of the world. So am I going to get mad that you're consuming content from the company next door or that you're consuming JavaScript, how to use Py, how to use, how to program in Python or JavaScript? I don't care because. I don't even create that. And even if I did, it will be very narrow-minded of me to say, oh, I want you to learn from me. I don't care. Learn however you can, but the bottom line is just learn and just learn what you need to learn to be able to function and be productive and valuable for your job. I have no qualms about anyone learning what they need to. As long as it's above board, if it's a dubious way of learning, like hacking in, into a system and stealing assets and uh, uh, pilfering people's videos, because honestly, some people do that, Daryl, which is the part that really irks me, that some people stay up at night and they're professionals and they're asking, this is where Daryl has put me on a trajectory, because this is one of the things that makes me mad when people are learning with stolen content, Daryl. You know what I mean. They're people, they're people who would rather steal my mentor's book or, or steal my book. They would rather mm -hmm. steal to learn than do it the ethical way. So if AI provides these people with a vehicle to learn without stealing phrases, I would even be an advocate for it because I have been hit by people stealing my audio books, putting them on repositories and freely sharing. And honestly, even forums for project management education, I hear people saying, oh, how can, how can I get a free copy of Pembok? It's not free. You're meant to be a member. Or on, on forums, how can I get this author or that author? And I'm like, no, Rita's book is not for free. You need to buy from Amazon or somewhere. Stop asking people for free copy. So that unethical behavior versus learning from an AI, <laughs> I would say, please learn from AI. You know, that, that's my disposition. Um, in terms of colleges, they also need to understand as a professor, you better have an edge 
over AI. Because if, if someone is learning from AI and is saying, that, oh, that's even better than Phil. Phil needs to get with the program and go beef up his skill in delivery because we have an advantage. The great Professor Emeritus Albert Morabian, whose work has been taken out of context a lot of times, he, he's, some of his core groundbreaking work just tells us if you're communicating a heartfelt emotional type of message, which a lot of learning is, a lot of learning can get very spirited and very debatable and hot. So in my mind, if you're communicating mm -hmm. that, you need to be aware it's not just the words that makes the communication great. It's not just the 7% of the words, but it's the 55% of the tone of the body language, 55%, and the tone of voice, the 38%. So you as a human, that's the advantage you have over an AI, to be able to teach with empathy, with mindfulness, by tailoring the pace, by using body language and facial expressions to make it even more far-reaching. If you as a trainer or coach are able to do that, you will always be a cut above AI because no one's going to ask AI to come give an inaugural speech or to come talk to their employees, but you will always have an edge over AI if you can do that. So when it comes to learning, it's twofold. If you are a trainer, get even better. AI can make you get even better. AI can critique you. I guess it's going to get to the point where AI may even be able to watch our videos and comment and say, you could have done this better. And then go learn it and put that back into your production. And you're going to be able to harness AI to make you even better. Like things I write, I, I write and I ask AI to critique or to improve. There's speeches that I've done and stuff that I've taken the transcript of and say, GPT, improve. And it does improve. First of all, it will find inconsistencies in some instances. It will find typos. Have you ever been corrected by GPT, Daryl? Has he ever corrected you about something? It has on many occasions. Yeah, yeah. It actually can quite proficiently correct you and give you advice about how to do whatever you were trying to do better. So when it comes to learning, I guess there's so many thoughts that come to mind, too many for me to articulate them all, but I think this is a good starting point, Daryl. And honestly, I think we should probably have this forum again where we invite some of our other friends to ask questions and partake of it. But in in winding down, Daryl, because we've spent about an hour going to an hour debating the whole AI thing, what are some of the closing ideas that you would like to share? Because I think we pretty much touched on everything. We talked about workforce disruption. We talked about ethical considerations. We've talked about learning. We've talked about data privacy and security. We've talked about ethical AI inclusion in the work you're doing. We've talked about the concern for humans just being able to have a job that AI isn't going to take away. We've talked about technological pace. We've talked about balancing innovation and regulation from a government perspective. We've talked about legal challenges. Uh, we've talked about music. We've talked about so many things. So I think this is a very good benchmark, Daryl. So in closing, do you want to share any final thoughts or ideas? So to close out this, this webinar, you know, again, thank you for this. This is really thank you. great information. It opens up discussions outside of this webinar. So to close it out, I ask everyone to don't be industry standards. Mm. By saying that, I'm asking everybody to use AI for good use, of, as in use it as a guide. Don't use it to depend on it or to create some sort of document for yourselves and use it to your advantage. Be always ethical and be always mindful and respectful of the tool and always control the tool. Never let the tool control you. 
Brilliant stuff. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to Daryl's channel, go to influenceipm.com, which is Daryl's website. We are both passionate about many things, but the confluence of our passions is project management, leadership, agile, mics of project, earn value, scheduling, and all things that are for good use of humans. As Daryl said, use AI ethically, use it for the good of humans, not destruction, not fraud, not violence. Thank you all very much, and we look forward to seeing you on our next debate.